Hi, I'm Jeff Ranke, Editorial Director of Manufacturing.net and Manufacturing Business Technology. Welcome to Security Breach. IBM research shows a 33% increase in cyber attacks against manufacturing companies between 2021 and 2022. Of course, according to IBM, 44% occurred because the industrial companies failed to apply the appropriate software patches that could have at least helped defend against the attack. With this in mind, it's not a surprise that additional data from the 2023 Open Tech Cybersecurity Threat Report found that manufacturing is the leader in terms of rate of malware infection, coming in at an infection rate that is more than 55% higher than the average for all industry verticals that would include healthcare, banking, education, and all the other ones. A lack of endpoint protection via patching, simple firewalls, or additional security protocols is obviously an issue for manufacturers. And if all these connections from legacy and recently implemented devices, machines, and systems continue to be improperly protected, the number of ransomware and distributed denial of service attacks will only continue to plague the 1.2 billion connection points that ABI Research is projecting by 2030. These are dynamics that today's guest deals with every single day. And I have to say in talking to him, this is one of the most positive, solution-focused episodes of Security Breach we've ever done. However, before we get to that and before we talk to our guest, we're excited to announce that Security Breach is being sponsored by Pentera. For more information on how automated security validation can help you safely test all your IT security controls with a click of a button in a non-stop industrial operational environment, visit Pentera.io. It's now my pleasure to introduce Randy Powell, Director of Cybersecurity at Ream Manufacturing, a leading global provider of HVAC equipment and hot water heaters. So I guess where we'd really like to, to start out is just talking about, as a manufacturer, what are some of the bigger vulnerabilities that you're coming across and, and how are you trying to address some of those things? No, that's an interesting question. And thanks for having me here today, Jeff. So, so let me talk about us. So Reams a manufacturer, but more than just a manufacturer, we're a global manufacturer that's kind of grown through acquisitions. So what that means is that our environment is a little bit unique in that since we're global, we have a lot of different regulatory requirements we have to comply with. Since we grow through acquisitions, at any time, I may have six to 12 different domains. I may have six to 12 different networks, some connected to the main network, some not. At any time, I can have six to 12 different IT support organizations that I have to interact with that may have configured their computers in the same way, maybe have not configured their computers in the same way. So when I'm thinking about vulnerabilities, it's really the, the big three that most people have. So we have IT infrastructure. And so all of the people's PCs, servers, network devices, and all those, um, the challenge is that since we're in a multi-domain, multi-network, being able to get visibility into them is a little bit tricky at times, depending on if you're remote, if you're in a plant, if you're in an office. Um, so that's one area that we focus on pretty extensively. The other, which is really the bridge between our factory and the IT group, is we sort of refer to it as the ITOT interfaces. Um, and so most of our ICS, uh, much of it, depending on the plants, because I have various different levels of plant maturity as well, um, is, is not really connected to the network. So some of their vulnerabilities, they're older, but they're not really as high of a risk because if you compromise them, you compromise a device itself. But a lot of places where the OT connects to the IT, I end up with a piece of IT right in the middle of it and so those tend to be varying levels of mature management from a different factories, but often older equipment and often with a very small maintenance window. So the vulnerabilities tend to show up pretty, pretty quickly there, especially if you have any zero days or anything that needs to be resolved pretty quickly. And then the third area that's really a complication for us is our engineering teams. Now, these are our most technical people which of course think they can do anything they want to and quite frankly need to. So there's a lot of trial and error. The configurations of their machines change pretty rapidly. They all need public facing access. They all need remote access for their testing data to be funneled through. So those are probably the biggest three areas that we focused on. And it's kind of always a little bit of a variety of what we're seeing. Yeah. 
I'm sure. So let's start a little bit with some of the more IT specific things. You mentioned a number of different email domains that you're dealing with. I'm sure that can create some unique challenges in terms of all of the phishing attacks that you might experience. Maybe you can talk maybe about some of the experiences or some of the, the challenges you've had there and some of the things you've done to try to keep people clued in on to making sure, hey, don't open this email, don't click on this link or, or similar types of tactics. Sure. And, it, and it's a challenge because we have different domains. So typically we, we utilize, you know, your training and awareness programming platforms that most people utilize. Um, it's integrated with our Office 365 tenant. So as we get you integrated into our technologies, then it's much easier for us. Um, when it's not integrated with our technologies, we try to make sure we work with the local HR teams or the whoever they may be, IT groups business leaders, whoever we can find to get us email address lists so that we can combine. And we use kind of a multifaceted approach because, you know, end users, as much as we can lock down the systems, um, they're unfortunately the first point of contact for a lot of the, especially phishing, but a lot of the different areas. So we do sort of a combination of annual required trainings, um, periodic micro trainings, if there's a specific um, incident occurs in the network and we can do a training on that. Um, we do kind of monthly tips and tricks that we send out via email or intranet if you're connected to us. Um, just trying to keep it in the back of your mind. We also try to, if possible, pick phishing attempts that we see and turn them around to leverage them either as a phishing test that we do ourselves um, or just a communication out to say, um, in fact, just this week, our CEO got a phishing attempt that was a docu to DocuSign Forge, and it referenced a signed document from our CLO. So he did exactly what we trained him to do. I wasn't expecting this. Let me reach out to the CLO. Let me ask him if he sent it. He said no, and he deleted the message, notified us exactly as trained. The CLO says, hey, wait a minute. This is pretty critical. We need to train. So we turned it around and made a notification that went out to our whole community, just kind of refreshing their memory. Hey, if it can happen to them, it can happen to you. Make sure you do what he did. Right? Absolutely. So we, we just try to stay on top of it and do it as consistently as possible. No, that's really encouraging to hear. You know, using the attack is basically an opportunity to to teach and train. I think that's the type of behavior we'd want more people to embrace. I have to ask, and again, I'm not looking to, to dig in here or have you divulge something that's going to get you in trouble, but have you had any experience with successful phishing attacks or spear phishing attacks? We have. So so it integrates with our security operations. So we have a, um, I'll tell you, we're not quite as mature in this area as we have. We, we have the phishing capability where you can click on the, the link and it immediately sends it. We don't leverage that very much. We've sent told everybody and trained them. We have a cybersecurity email address, please send it to this. That way you can attach the email. We can have correspondence back and forth with you a little bit simpler. Um, but we tell people to do that all the time. And so we have sure. um, a person on my security operations team that part of his job is just to go through there. And as he replies, he also tries to educate. Um, we, we do get successful ones occasionally. Um, the most significant ones are ones where the person takes two steps. Right. And so if you, you take one step, I click on the link, we're scared. We do an evaluation of your machine and, and we try to make sure that nothing malicious has been installed or you didn't. But if you take the second step, which we'll say has happened, um, <laughs> where you may click on the link, enter your credentials because you're trying to verify something that Microsoft says was urgent for you to do. Um, we, we just ask now we get those alerts. And if we find out through security operations, we're not quite as friendly when you call you back, although not tremendously mean either. But if you come to us directly, we're quick to jump on and say, hey, what did you do? Step them through the why you shouldn't have done what you did. And then we go through and evaluate, you know, change your credentials, look for any compromised um, IOCs, look for what the phishing attempt was, go across the email systems, make sure we retract it from anybody else. If anybody else received it and opened it, we communicate with them and do the same thing. Yeah, you know, but it happens. There's the, I'd love to say it never happens, but it happens. Yeah, you're not alone. You know, that's that's one of the, the great things about this type of dialogue. And what we try to do with the podcast is really just get the information out there that manufacturers are not alone. We're in this together. And the more information we can share, the better for, for all involved. I, you know, I have to ask a little bit, going back to some of that human factor, because that's becoming such a bigger part of cybersecurity uh, strategies. 
How have you seen that sort of evolve over time? You know, I think there is a reticence in some cases for employees to say, man, I clicked on the link, something screwed up here. How do you address the sort of the training and having them understand the ramifications of those attacks with also, also making it sure that you're receptive to hearing from them and you want to know as soon as possible if something bad did happen? It seems like it could be kind of a tough situation to juggle. It, it is, and I can give you probably two simple examples of the extremes of those. So every time we do a training, we send it with a communication that, that talks about this is what we want you to do. Reach out to us. Um, we've tried things like competitions. If, if you report fishing and successful, you get your name drawn for a, a gift certificate. Um, we haven't had a tremendous amount of turnout on those kind of things, although we were trying to sort of be the positive, nice guys, you know, the good cops in the room. Um, but but it, sometimes it works and sometimes it does. I give you the example of our CEO who did exactly what he was supposed to do. And it's it's interesting and not so much funny, but it's interesting that he knows who on my team he needs to send his email to. So he sends it to him directly. He sometimes bypasses the cybersecurity email box that we would like him to and sends it to the, the guy who's on my team who takes care of it. Yeah. Um, and, and that's interesting because he's very positive. He's very on top of it. But I've had another one. It was, I guess, about four years ago where we had an account analyst who entered her credentials into a phishing email and then was scared. Right now, I know I did something wrong. She immediately knew, um, oh, no, I can't tell because I'm going to get in trouble. Um, unfortunately, we found out a step later, right? So yeah. once her, somebody tried to uh, you know, compromise her account, um, we, we detected it and our security operation took over. But we weren't quite as good cop in that case because but no punitive damages per se, but a training session that she had to go yeah. through and her manager knew and it got escalated to the, the parties that be. So we try to take the good cop as much as possible and try to educate, um, highlight when people are successful. That was the the comment about turning around a successful one to everybody so they can see it, it happens to the CEO. It can happen to you. Yeah. If he's willing to tell us about it, you should be willing to tell us about it. We can't quite have punitive damage to the CEO, so that may not be as effective, <laughs> but for, yeah. for other people it may be. No, makes sense. I mean, we've heard some horror stories, um, CEOs being fired and things like that because of some of these phishing schemes that resulted in huge sums of money. So it's it's unfortunately not a unique situation, but it's great to hear the the steps were right steps were taken. So yeah, so we try. I mean, that's yeah. that's what we judge ourselves on, right? Do we take the right steps? Because you know, like all companies, we're evolving our security. The threats are getting more complicated. You talk about AI. And, you know, now we have things that can learn what's successful and not successful and tailor their attacks based on the success rate. So it's always going to be a constant battle. Um, we just sort of preach, do the right thing, and hopefully we stay in front. Absolutely. Shifting gears a little bit, you talked about, you know, with expansion and acquisitions, that that's going to impact plant floor technology and communications as well. So shifting over a little bit to the OT side of things, what have been some of your bigger challenges there? I mean, we, we hear about an influx of new technology attaching to legacy systems, creating potentially more vulnerabilities at connection points or endpoints. What have been some of the things that you've seen from an OT perspective that, that keep you awake at night? So I'll tell you that we're actually still going through it, right? So, yeah. so we, you know, if I flash back five years ago in our organization, we were kind of a steady state organization. The factories were running, we were growing through acquisition and, and just normal growth. COVID came, not a lot of um, innovation and, and changes were made during those, those couple of years. We've now in the past couple of years kind of engaged in a more rapid pace technology implementation. And one of those is around our OT environment. Right, because we want to make sure that but we have about 27 facilities around the, the globe and we want them all to be equally as secure. And so if we look at one, I'll try to not tell you specifics, but um, we look at one and they're they're sort of a, ahead of the rest. They're, they've got their vulnerability capabilities wrapped around their IT OT bridges. Um, they have monitoring around their OT. They have segmentation in their different lines. Um, it, it's a pretty, mature for us um, environment. And then I have 15 other ones that really have almost nothing, right? And so doing a current state assessment, doing training user, this is what to be careful of, this is what to look for. If you see anything suspicious, raise it. Um, not to be a cliche, but if you see something, say something. 
um, from an educational perspective. And then we're, we're in the active process of trying to incorporate our um, security operation processes that we use in IT into our OT strategy. And so that as we continue to move across the globe and mature, that we can be just as successful over there. Sure. Are there specific things that you're looking for now when you implement new new devices, new machinery, new connection points, control systems, whatever it may be, that the security become a bigger part of that purchasing decision or a part of that? Maybe you could talk us through a little bit of some of those new considerations that you really have to take to take into account for. Sure. And and it's actually right now a great time and ream for us to be involved. So we're we're going through a digital transformation. And so one of the things that our senior leadership is has bought into all the way up to the board level is that security is critical. That if we're going to expand and part of the expansion of our digital transformation, let me take a pause and go to the side, includes optimizing the digitizing our factories, making it more connected. It includes consolidating ERPs, which are making the risk higher of those. It includes upgrading our infrastructure, includes moving more to the cloud, includes data analytics. So because of that, the senior leadership and their board said security is important. And so they, if you look at our work streams that we're actively investing in, security is one of them. It's been communicated to everybody in the organization. We talk about it all the time. And so any projects that get implemented now or even initiated, the first step is have you talked to security? Have you engaged them in the project? And so it, it really aids us in just even the selection of tools, right? Because yeah. uh, uh, in the old days, um, which was only a couple of years ago, right? Not that old of a date. Um, <laughs> the, the different business units would make their own purchasing decisions for technology and they wouldn't consider anything except for production, right? What does it take to replace what I have right now with something slightly newer? And those factors don't take into account security necessarily. You know, it's sort of maybe it's secure, maybe it's not, depending on what I pick. Um, now we're actively involved in the in the process. So every... Um, architectural review board, every decision on technology implementation has a security representative from my team that's looking at the architecture, that's talking to the vendors um, when they shortlist them specifically and making sure we go through the steps to evaluate it from a security standpoint. Not just a how secure they are and if it's a cloud solution, what kind of processes they have, but how it integrates with our IT, how it integrates with our security operations and how it leverages tools that we already have. So, you know, one of the things we always talk about, and it's so great to hear that you've got buy-in up to the executive level like that. We always talk about this as a culture thing, whether it's plant floor safety, cybersecurity, whatever it is, it really comes within the culture of the organization. It seems like Ream really has that going for it. Can you pinpoint anything that maybe helped really institute or drive a lot of that culture that really focuses on cybersecurity? Yeah, so let me let me back up a second. It's a culture we're trying to put in place. The board has bought into it and the senior leaders have all endorsed it. And we're actively trying to put in place. But but the key is executive championship. Right. So I build our security strategy. I preach our security strategy. I prioritize our security in, initiatives and investments. Um, but when the, our CTO and then our CEO said, yes, this is a priority equal to all the other investments we're making in the plant, then all the other leaders were involved. Our presidents, our GMs were, were all accepting of it. They all support it. And now, unlike five years ago, um, now when people talk about implementing new technology, I hear them talk about security. Is it ingrained in all of them? No. But they know it's important, so they know to engage us. And we go and as an advocate for them, helping enable what they're doing, hopefully most of the time supporting what they're doing, um, we're trying to build that culture in, in place. I, I have this optimism that when I look back three years from now, then I'll say, well, five years ago when we started this endeavor, we were here and now we're here. Um, we're in the middle of it right now, so, so we're continually working on it. Yeah, well, it's a journey without a doubt. Do you think that that executive buying, did that come in? Is that just organic to them? Is that something understood? Is it something you had to champion a little bit? Past experiences play a role? Or, or what do you think really drove that? Yeah, it's a combination. So our CEO is fantastic. He's very tech savvy. He, he loves technology. And he bought in immediately. Um, our CTO is our, kind of our champion. He's the advocate out to all the business of digital transformation as a whole. And he's a huge advocate for it. 
Um, was it me championing it to him? Maybe, maybe not. Right. We'll, we'll see. He, he understood, bought in and, and understood not, maybe not that it takes security to enable the organization, which is what we always like to say, but that without security, you have a big risk of disabling the organization. And as we go through a digital transformation, the risk becomes greater and greater and greater as we expose vulnerabilities to threats that are in the market. We're just opening ourselves up. You'd never do it at your house. Why would you do it at work? Right. Yeah. So, so he's bought into it. So our CTO and our CEO have both really kind of bought into it and championed it. And if you get the CEO to champion it, you're in pretty good shape. Right. Yeah. So I would love for all my GMs to be exactly as enthusiastic as my CEO and CTO. Some of them are, some of them maybe not as much, but they're all come adopting it because those two are the big champions. What do you think is the roadblock sometimes? Do you think like, hey, this we're not significant enough to get hit. This is just, it's slowing me down from getting product out the door. What do you think is maybe that stops people from embracing at the level that you'd like? I think just busy. I, I yeah. think that, that's really the, the challenge. The GMs, and I understand, they get paid to produce product. Yeah. Right, get product out the door. That that's their job is to produce product. Yes, they want to do it efficiently. Yes, they want to do it with high quality and all the other metrics that they have. But they're trying to get product out the door. And as I come in and say, "Oh, wait a minute. Let's look at your business process. Let's look at integrating the technology. I need you to provide some resources for this initiative so that we can work with you." It's taking away their ability to produce product. Yeah. So it, it's a challenge. So it, it takes a mind on their part and, and I commend them every time they they support that because it literally takes resources away from producing more products. Yeah. Um, I, my my positive spin is optimistically, let's keep let's keep doing it. Let's make sure we, we can do it. Um, but it it's also real world. It it's convenient when the GMs and the board who don't pay attention to technology but pay attention to the Wall Street Journal see the, yeah. the the increase in press that manufacturing is getting now, let me let me let me take a side step again um when i sh started with reem a little over six years ago um i was in a discussion with our ceo and our security leader at the time made a comment to him that one of our biggest security protections is the fact that we're not under attack that that at that time it was financial industry it was healthcare industry. It wasn't manufacturing. Yeah. Well, that's completely different now, you know, due to to the pipeline, to the meat packing, due to the news. Manufacturing is one of the top attacked industries in the market. Well, the board sees that, and so when I come and talk about risk, they come and have these grand aspirations of of growth and expansion. It's a good combination. Yeah. Well, you know, you referenced Colonial and, and JBS, and those are kind of the ones that have gotten a ton of attention. Have you either at Ream or someplace else in your experience, have you experienced an OT-specific attack that has maybe offered some some framework that you put around your approach or your strategies now? Um, it, we did have an attack of a company that we were bringing on or investigating bringing on that I referenced in in some of my communications. But but not a specific OT one. I referenced those two heavily when we were getting started. Um, and I do a lot of what if scenarios in my communications. And so I, I look at, at pull from the news. Here's, here's a simple attack. Those two were sort of where I started with. If this happened to Reem, here's the impact. Um, and it, it's been a growth process. So I've sort of, I would say baby steps. I sort of started slow. Right. If that happens to us, what's the impact? We do data breach simulations and I have the controller there and we run through scenarios and say, OK, if you come from if you came into the factory and you compromised one system, what's the impact? And let's sit here and talk about what, what does it mean? What do we lose if a line is down? What do we lose if it bridges over to our label printing and you can't print labels? And, and it's an interesting discussion because the controller, it, it's all about money. Right. And and what is the loss? And everybody else in the room, operations, IT, um, start thinking about what does it mean for us? And he's thinking, what does it mean for Ream? And then we usually take those scenarios and we bridge up to if we don't stop it, if we don't have the capabilities to isolate it to first, I guess, identify it, 
leverage our security operations, our IR plan, if that were to happen and stop it, then it bridges into Ream and you start getting ERPs or you start getting ransomware or, or something much more significant. What does that impact? And it, in fact, in our last data breach simulation, it, we did a ransom that hit enterprise was our sort of top level. That's as, kind of as big as you can get. And he sort of just sat back and he's like, well, game over. We're, we're done. I'm like, I, I hear you. We can't have game over. That's when we, <laughs> we got to get the busiest. So, oh. so it, it's a, a pretty interesting conversation. So I, I don't know that I answered your question. I don't know that I, I mentioned any specific ones. I, I don't usually go to the, I try not to scare tactic too much. I, mm -hmm. I've done it and I kind of try to look at specific things we're doing. And if an attack happened here, if a risk happened here, what would be the impact to us? Yeah. And, and do a lot of what if. Yeah. Well, understanding how to respond to those attacks is just as important as identifying them in the first place. Absolutely. I mean, we hear these nightmares about people getting hit and they can't get somebody out of their system, that dwelling uh, within, and then they get hit again another six to eight months. So it's just an ongoing concern. So it's encouraging to hear a lot of the things that, that you guys are doing and hopefully others can learn from that as well. Yeah. I mean, I hope we continue to learn from that. Right. So that's, that's another factor that we have kind of part of our security operations plan is is every time we see something, whether it was a compromised phishing email or a malware that showed up or or some attempt, we, we try to take that and run with it and say, do we have any vulnerabilities anywhere else that, that could be exploited? We had one, I don't want to tell too many specifics, but we had one where it, it wasn't successful, but our security operations alerted us that there was a kind of a brute force RDP attempt to someone who was in a Starbucks. and. They didn't get through, they didn't, they didn't compromise the computer, um, but it immediately, we responded to it and said, okay, let's go see where RDP services are turned on, right? Across our industry. In fact, we use Tanium to do that as our endpoint sort of management tool. So we ask a question and in 15 seconds, we have, here's all the machines that have RDP service turned on. And we go through an evaluation to say, these we need because of remote administration inside of our system. These we don't need, well, we need to go remediate that. And like I said before, we have a global, not so connected, not so standardized environment in some of our areas. And so we identify, hey, here's a pocket of machines that all have it turned on. Let's go fix it. And the good thing about tools in our multi-environment like Tanium is we can see all that instantaneously. So this threat hunting that we do as a response to an, an event, it, it's really beneficial, hopefully, in us learning. Yeah. Well, let's talk about some of these tools. You mentioned Tanium. Um, you mentioned a lot of your processes and procedures. There's a ton of different tools out there. It can be it can be difficult to just to sort through them. Maybe you can offer some perspective on the things that you've seen work most effectively for you and Ream. So, so we have different layers of tools. Our, one of our approaches is we want platforms instead of just tools. Um, we have historically bought tools. Hey, this is a best in class for this. This is a best in class for that. I don't know best in class is always the right word, but um, different tools to do a lot of different things. Yeah. Um, what we've tried to do recently and in the past three years or so is try to leverage capabilities that can do multiple things. So Tanium is a, a perfect example of that. So we use Tanium initially just for visibility into our configuration. So if we had an incident and we needed to go troubleshoot, does this DLL exist anywhere in our environment? Is this configuration on any machines? We could quickly go and ask a question for that. But as we did that, we started to also leverage it to identify any IOCs that we could trigger as an alert from Tanium that says this endpoint is configured like this, notify us if, if we have those IOCs occur. And that can feed into our security operations processes. Um, we then evolved, and this is a somewhat of a recent occurrence, is since we have Tanium deployed globally, now let me step back to my environment. I, they're not on the same AD environment, so an IT team in the enterprise can't necessarily reach out and touch that machine. They're not always at work because we're in a hybrid environment. So getting them to bring it up to let somebody work on it is not always immediately accessible. But with Tanium, we can then, with through the patch and deploy modules, we can then go and deploy an update to the configuration. We can go remove a piece of software. We can go install patches and make sure those are standardized. So using a platform, we get a lot of different capabilities. And if we do an incident investigation, which is the, the original reason we bought Tanium, um, it, it gives us exactly what we want and the ability to remediate 
and the ability to generate reports and trends and, and show us what we're doing. Um, so that's that's an example of the platform. Um, we, we use another platform, which is a Rapid X, Rapid Seven platform that we use for our security operations that integrates with with other capabilities, so that we can tie to our cloud environments, we can tie to our application um, security vulnerability assessments um, that 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 use that. So we're trying to to look for solutions that can work in a multi-cloud hybrid environment that's global, that gives us the ability from a limited number of resources that we have, because we're still manufacturing, we're not overstaffed. Um, I would like to find a company that is overstaffed. But, but that <laughs> right now, that'd be a challenge, yeah. Yeah, that's not us. Um, and so we're trying to leverage tools as much as possible. Um, so that's the key. It's one challenge or one benefit that that gives us also is we're, one of the things that we're doing in digital transformation is trying to move from primarily an on-premise to a cloud first type of strategy. And so what that means is we actually have a hierarchy that if the business application can be SaaS, we'd like it to be SaaS. It takes away a little bit of our risk, doesn't really take away the risk, but it pushes some of that risk out to the yeah. provider. Um, and if not that, then then cloud, and we're a multi-cloud environment, but we have our preferred. And if not that, then on-premise if, if we need to. And so looking at enterprise tools helps us bridge that gap as well. So we can integrate, let's just take security logging. We can integrate a SaaS application in our security logs. We can integrate cloud capabilities into our security logs. We can integrate our on-premise environment into our security logs, all be consolidated, correlated and trigger events so that we can see sort of end to end if an attack ever happens. So let's just talk about indicators of compromise instead of actual attacks. And, and, and trigger our actions. So I don't know if that, that completely answers your question, but but we try to use point solutions if we have to, but we try to leverage platforms. No, I think that's an interesting um, kind of delineation there, platforms versus tools. I think with your size, a platform makes a ton more sense, whereas sometimes a tool can work. The challenge there is we've seen some smaller manufacturers plug in so many tools, they get layered on top of each other and they're just not as effective as they could be if they were really utilized properly and, and more extensively, I, th I think, is the, the key there. Well, well Aaron, tools are all evolving as well. So if yeah. if I think about what our tool set will look like five years from now, as opposed to now, right, with AI and the, the launching of that, I assume every tool is going to have AI. So if I buy two tools that do sort of the same thing, but are two different spaces, cloud or on-premise, by the time we wrap AI into it and they evolve over the next year, they're going to have an 80% overlap and I'm going to end up having two tools I'm supporting that are doing primarily the same job. Um, not that we've never done that before, but <laughs> I'd like to not do that going forward. Um, and you know how tools evolve. With Tanium, we've evolved with them as we've gotten more mature, we've leveraged more of their capabilities so we can add on modules, which is pretty slick. And then they've evolved and they have relationships with like Microsoft. So the integration into Azure and Intune and, and some of those things, as we did our digital transformation and moved into those worlds, their capabilities were now available to us as we needed them. So it, it's so far been a, a pretty successful strategy. Ask me again in five years and we'll see, but so far it's been a pretty good strategy. I hope we're still doing the podcast in five years, not because we have to, but because it's useful enough. Um, <laughs> you know, so, and you can have me back <laughs> and I can tell you this was even more successful than I thought it was going to be. Excellent. Hey, so Randy, you've mentioned a couple of these things, but I want to throw some sort of hot topics, hot cybersecurity buzz terms, if you will, at you. One of which, and you've, you've talked about this a lot, is cloud. You know, it's more and more manufacturers got on the cloud, especially during the pandemic. They needed more remote access. They needed to be able to share data more seamlessly. But a lot of times they forgot to check the security elements of it in the process. Maybe you can talk us through maybe some best practices or lessons learned in terms of embracing the cloud for the benefits, but making sure you're taking care of things from a security perspective during the uh, along the way. Yeah, so, so let me tell you what we're trying to do, right? Instead of the best practices, and I haven't proven all that out because we're going through this cloud first strategy now. So we're, we, we've, we know that we're going to be in kind of a multi-hybrid environment. We've selected Azure as our primary cloud, our preferred cloud. Um, we're doing a lot of data analytics, so we're starting to move data from um, old systems, from ERPs, from customer CRMs, um, and we're trying to consolidate that into EDPs, um, enterprise data platforms inside of Azure. So we're, we're, we built that out and we've taken the care to put all the security controls around it using our cloud strategy, right? Our, our governance, our data security, our application security, vulnerability endpoint, um, 
access controls, right? The whole sort of layer of that strategy. And so if, if you ask me how we're doing with Azure, I'll tell you we're doing really well. Um, we also have AWS and GCP in parts of our environment that are other parts of from our enterprise that we haven't done quite as well on. So our, our plan is to take the strategy that we've implemented here, pull it out, put it into there. We try to use enterprise solutions. So hopefully it's a matter of just turning them on and now we're in good shape. You know, it's never quite that easy. So the, the intricacies of GCP or AWS will then tweak and tune how you integrate to our security logging. But remember we have a limited staff, so we wanna be able to make sure that we can do the security operations and, and management of that. So we, we started with the strategy. What are all the key components? We looked at our enterprise solutions that we had already, which ones work, what do we need to add? And then we implemented those in one. And now we're picking them up and starting to move them to the others. Um, in the process, we Oracle is our ERP, our primary ERP. And so we're going to Oracle Cloud. So I just keep naming off every cloud that's possible. Um, <laughs> I'm not the one who makes the business decisions on cloud. I'm the one who yeah. says, let's go secure it if you pick it, right? Yeah. Here's the decision. So we're going to OCI right now as well. And that project's full steam ahead. And because we have a strategy, these are the pieces that we have to go put in place. And we integrate all the components of Oracle's capabilities into our our security operations as well. So knock on wood, it, it appears to be working. We still gotta finish it. But you were you were taking proactive steps to make sure it's secure as well. I mean it wasn't just basically, hey, we're in the cloud, we're we're good to go. Um, are you seeing more responsibility from the cloud providers? Are they being more proactive in saying, hey, this is secure for these reasons? Or is it up to the customer and the manufacturer to push them a little bit and say, hey, we need this level of security to make this work? So so a little bit of both, right? So it, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's a lot of, we offer you security tools. Um, wow, okay. And so here, buy this, buy this, buy this. Um, and that comes from all the platforms, right? I, not yeah. not just the ones we're on, but probably all about or anywhere else too. Um, that here's our solutions for it, and some of those are global, right? Could go multi-cloud, um, but a lot of them aren't that mature yet, right? They're growing as the market's growing, um, and so they may be point solutions. So in one sense, it helps us a lot because they come and say, "Hey, look, these are all the pieces you need to put in place, and we have this, and we have this, and we have this, and we have this." And I leverage that to say, thank you for telling me all the pieces you think I need to put in place. Do you have the governance controls that I can integrate with, with my governance program? So in that case, they're helping me. Um, and then not so much because if I don't have the budgets or want to buy their tools, then I didn't have to do all the integration and the planning and, and all that alone. I'll use an example um, that just happened today. So Oracle, our OCI progress came up and said, hey, look, here's a capability compliance um report we want to meet with you to talk about when do you want us to turn this on and schedule it and it does just cis based benchmarking um when do you want us to turn it on who do you want the reports to go to and and i'm like that's i appreciate that except we already have compliance reporting in our platform as well so we can do that same benchmarking from our tool that doesn't only look at oci but looks at our environments everywhere else so so i appreciate you leaning forward and helping me um but in that case it was kind of up to me to get it done. Yeah. They would have done it if I didn't have anything. So I guess if I didn't have the strategy that we have from a cloud security, then I would leverage a lot of those capabilities. Um, yeah. I find them very proactive in saying security is first. They read the newspaper too. <laughs> they, <laughs> they know that we are. Um, yeah. But it's kind of a, in my opinion, you have to take ownership of your security because if you let them and you get attacked, still your fault. Yeah, but absolutely. We still own it. So I want to throw another one at you, and you kind of referenced this when we first started talking a little bit, but a lot of organizations really struggle with the, having their IT and their OT folks sort of in a siloed dynamic, and they're, they're not really working together and talking to each other. It seems like in a lot of instances, maybe not throughout the enterprise, but in a lot of instances, you found a way to break down those silos a little bit. Maybe you could talk about how that's helped from a cybersecurity perspective and, and some of the ways you've, you've tried to push that along. It, it's helping. I'll, I'll talk about some of the ways we're pushing along because it really, especially, I call them regional IT teams. Um, that's probably a, a poor use of terms. They're really different business units. 
So if we have a business unit that's in Europe, we have, may have another business unit in Europe, um, they operate to some degree as two different business units in their silos supporting the local GM that has, remember, their objectives of producing more product. And so when it comes to us in the enterprise, um, we historically have come off as kind of the dictators, right? Hey, you need to go do this. You need to go do this. We don't give them resources. We don't give them tools. We just tell them to go, go execute. And so what we've done to try to change that is we've, we've A, tried to communicate with them and the project teams up front as much as possible. So if we're going to implement some new capability or a new tool, we want to engage them as quickly as possible. Since we have a whole lot of them, they don't all get to be part of the project team, but we want to communicate out. So we started a, a I call it a security governance council. It's not really about governance, so it's more about communication. Because I think we need to communicate up and out as much as possible about what, what are the risks, what are active vulnerabilities, what are environmental risk, what projects are we using to try to remediate those and try to engage them as much as possible. If you had them on the podcast, they would say, well, you're not doing that great of a job, Randy, because they're still actively doing it. But we attempt to do that. We've also attempted to, at a lower level, inside of the projects, to make sure we're engaging them to get their feedback. We want to improve a, let me use a data as an example, because data is one of our big focuses right now. Um, we want to understand as much as possible about what kind of sensitivity data you're storing in all of your systems. So we want to engage you sometimes taking your resources, um, but to understand what sensitivity levels you have. Is it regulatory sensitivity like GDPR in Europe? Is it proprietary information that you're storing in this system? Is it just kind of cool stuff you're working on that we don't want other people to know about? Um, let me know what kind of sensitivity data and try to engage them in the um, project so we're not directing. And then from an operational standpoint, we tried to systematically put meetings in that are between us on the cyber team and the technology teams whether that's the developers, whether that's the engineers, whether that's the IT teams, to look at things like vulnerabilities and remediation. So we can meet, and depending on what it is, if it's application development type of vulnerabilities or application testing, it may be once a month. It may be at certain milestones in the project. If it's patching and vulnerabilities, that type of infrastructure, then we have them every other week. And we have some in the morning, we have some in the evening, so we can hit the different parts of the world. And we, both IT that's doing the patching and us that's doing vulnerability management, sit with the local IT team to tell them status of patching, telling vulnerabilities that exist and where we need their support. And we're just trying to break down any walls there are, right? Silos are really, really tough. And when you run really, really fast, like Reem's doing right now, um, it's easier to get into silo than it has ever been. So we're yeah. sort of actively trying to break down those silos because it's, it's easy to focus on I have 70 to 100 hours worth of work to do this week, so I can't pay attention to you. Well, let's break them down and try to to get us talking so that collectively we can make sure we're securing room. No, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that communication is vital. And it also seems basically you're helping reinforce the significance, the importance of the work all of these teams are doing and helping understand that's why we want to keep it secure. Like you said before, we're not trying to slow you down here. We know what you, you're trying to accomplish, but we want to uh, – understand how important it is and keep it safe. So that makes a lot of sense. And it definitely helps to have senior leadership buy-in because at yeah. times they don't want to attend the meeting. They don't want to <laughs> tell us what yeah. data is sensitive in their organization. And when project statuses specifically get escalated, it, it gets goes up and down, right? That's part of the communication. I say up, out, and across is kind of my, my phrase is I communicate up so they know where we stand. And nobody wants to show up on a report as the, the red box or the red circle on your status report. Yeah. Um, I, I had one example I use, I call it peer pressure management. Um, but we were talking about just, I call it cyber hygiene, but making sure our tools are deployed on your endpoints. And I generated a report that wasn't complete, but it had, here's all the different business units, the regions, and where they stood from a compliance standpoint about having tools deployed correctly. And we were in a meeting, a security council meeting, and I said, so we're going to start generating these reports and then we're going to start delivering them up to the GMs and the, the presidents. And I just showed on the screen, I didn't even mention anything on the report. And one of our business units had not deployed one of our tools at all, right? It was the biggest goose egg on his report. And I didn't mention it. I said, but we're going to start reporting. Well, the next month when we had our meeting, he was like 98%. 
And I didn't mention to it at all. Didn't pressure him to go do it, even though we had pressured him in the past. But a little peer pressure. Wait a minute. I'm the one who sticks out because I'm not compliant. Right. So those things help as well. Um, those are kind of the bad cop side of me. Um, I try to be <laughs> as collaborative and communicative as possible, but sometimes it takes multiple approaches. Absolutely. Well, the one I have to ask you about, and you've referenced it a couple times as well, but it's a huge topic right now in cybersecurity, is AI and artificial intelligence. As that's continued to evolve, it seems like there's benefits for the good guys and obviously for the bad guys. The ones that the bad guys can exploit because it's getting more attention and keeping people upset and paranoid and keeping them up at night. What's your take here in terms of what AI brings to the table as a potential threat, but also as a potential tool? I'm I'm both excited and scared to death at the same time, right? <laughs> yeah. So I think I'm I'm like most of us, right? So yeah. we all have sort of that capability. Um, so the exciting part is I mentioned it that I think five years from now every one of my tools is going to have AI, and so if all of them are doing attacker behavior analysis, IOC analysis, um, they're doing. I, I mentioned if if we see something and we go look. If it automatically goes and looks, think of the resources and time that it's going to save me and my team so we can focus on real incidents, right, instead of false positives or investigations into things. Um, so those kind of things really excite me. Um, it's going to help us advance our strategy faster than it's ever been, right? We're on sort of a journey right now to advance it, but new capabilities, new technologies, they're all going to come out and it's going to keep us trying to advance it within Ream. So that's the exciting part. Our business has some some pockets of the super technical people who are super pumped, right? We're doing this big data analytics focus, right? Pulling customer data, pulling distributor data, pulling production data, pulling forecasting data, pulling ERP data, all into these EDPs so that we can make better decisions. They're super psyched about AI. Um, and so from my perspective, it's it's exciting, but the part that scares me is we don't really know what the regulations and the protections are gonna be going forth. And so we've taken a position at Ream that you can use AI if it's embedded into your tools and doesn't feed a public AI engine, right? right. So if you want to feed a public AI engine, then we don't allow you to put any Ream information in there, not personnel information, not production information, not sales or forecast or anything can go into the engine. So, so that part scares me um, a little bit because we don't know what's going to end up. Right. Does it end up that anything that you put in a public engine is now public domain and it can be pulled out in reports? I know that's not the objective of it, but bad actors get access to things that aren't just green. Right. So um, that, that's a part of it. Um, the other part is what if you start producing things using these AI engines that were trained on something else? Who owns that IP? We're trying to do some innovative things and, and we think we're staying unique in the market. And so we want to make sure we own on that type of IP. Um, so our organization is probably not the leading edge on AI, but we're having discussions, which in my mind is the starting point to, to actually everything, right? If we get the senior leadership and the, the business units talking about how we can use it, but how we can use it successfully and in a secure way, we're okay. Um, yeah. But we'll see, right? That's, it's going to be a lot faster, a lot smarter than me, a lot faster than me. So um, we will see. Yeah. You know, got to ask you too, being a global company with production plants in different countries and things like that, we've seen a lot of stuff going on basically kind of evolving around the Russia-Ukraine conflict, a lot of stuff going on in China with state-sponsored terrorist groups, ransomware groups, whatever you want to say, going after U.S. infrastructure companies and manufacturing. Knowing that this is out there, has that had an effect on your cybersecurity planning? Yeah, not not specifically. We know it's there. Um, so... What we've seen is a lot of increased frequency of attempted infiltration, right? It used to be, like I said, six years ago, we made the comment about nobody's attacking us, so we're good. Um, now it seems to be a lot more, but they seem to be using the same tactics that we would normally see. Access our perimeters. Do you have vulnerabilities on your VPNs, end user devices, phishing attempts? They, they, the symptoms tend to be the same so far. Um, we obviously are reading the papers and the intel feeds, right, to make sure we're staying on top of it. But we haven't really changed our strategy to say, well, now it's going to be state-sponsored as opposed to ransom as a service or, or or something else that could be just as malicious, just happens to be from somebody trying to make money instead of somebody trying to 
cause harm to America. So I haven't really changed my strategy, but we're on top of it, right? We know it's a risk. We know the um, attempts are much more frequent than they used to. So you got to be on track. I, I make the comment all the time that, you know, we have to be successful every time and they only have to be successful once. So we got to stay on our toes. Um, so hopefully we have defense in depth. So even if we're not successful once, we catch them at some point before. It's, it's too bad, but um, not sure that was the right answer that you want, right? So but no, we, I haven't, think it's... we haven't stressed about it. Um, <laughs> I, I quite frankly stress more about the AI than I do about the, the state sponsor. Um, maybe that's backwards, but um, I don't think unknown, you're wrong either way. Yeah, I don't think you're wrong either way. Randy, this has been fantastic. Really appreciate you sharing all this insight and experience with us. Anything else you'd like to share before we go, whether it's maybe some trends that you see coming down the road or other things that you're focused on right now? Yeah, so we're hopefully like a lot of organizations, we, we're we in a great spot right now with senior leadership focused on security is important. And so we're investing in security. We're, we're saddling that investment or making sure it stands beside our investments in our business. Right. That's where the money is. So so we're going to continue to invest in that. So uh, we're in a really good spot in in that part of our organization. Hopefully manufacturing organizations stay investing in it because we would like to five years from now not be the place they're targeting, move to somebody else who's not been investing in it. Um, but what I see, I think I think we just got to be on our toes because AI, I think, is going to lead the way. I, I think the attacks are going to trend upward. I think the investment is going to trend upward. Um, not just at Ream, but but everywhere. Um, because of that, we just have to make sure that we're diligent to invest in the right places to be able to stop the advancements that are making. Um, at least that's my plan for us, my hope for us, maybe, um, and I hope for everybody else. Because it'd be nice to come to an environment where we're not quite as important. I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. To catch up on past episodes, you can go to manufacturing.net, ien.com, or mbtmag. Com. You can also check Security Breach out wherever you get your podcasts, including Apple, Amazon, and Overcast. And if you have a cybersecurity solution or topic that you'd like to have us explore in Security Breach, you can reach me at jeff at ien.com. I'd also encourage you to download our latest cybersecurity report, The New Battlefield for Manufacturers. You can find that link in today's description. For Randy Powell, I'm Jeff Ranke, and this is Security Breach.